Okay, today we're going to talk about the Torah. Um, this corresponds with the uh, introduction of Torah and Genesis uh, set of PowerPoints and or PDF in the website. First slide I, I talk about is the nature of Torah, I kind of you overview, uh, mention the teaching. Um, we, you know, some context is often translated as law, but it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not law, it's, it's an instruction or teaching or guidance if you will. And there's uh, uh, five books of the Torah, or, or the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Sometimes these are associated with uh, Moses, called the Books of Moses. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, his, a historical connection. Some people credit Moses as writing those. Um, modern scholars debate that. They often talk about the documentary hypothesis, uh, so, but something to think about. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11 is with the premedial history. Genesis 12 through 50 focuses on the patriarchs. Uh, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, Joseph, char characters and figures like that. Um, Genesis 37 through 50 is sp uh, specifically focuses in on Joseph uh, and acts as, uh, and, and his acts and works in, in Egypt. Um, and this offers a transition, although it's an odd transition over to Exodus. Exodus 1 through 18 talks about the story of Moses and Israelites in Egypt uh, and then uh, their exodus from Egypt. 19 through 40 of Exodus and Leviticus uh, talk about some of the implications or the counter sign and implications thereof. Numbers describe the journey in the wilderness for the most part. There's a few little bumps and hiccups there, like for example the running into Balaam and his donkey, his infamous donkey. Uh, Deuteronomy is kind of portrayed as Moses' farewell, uh, uh, his swan song, his summary of what's happened and what's going to happen. Um, it's kind of portrayed as being Moses at Nebo looking down on the promised land not be able to enter and what's happened so far. It's a retelling. Some scholars even call it the proto um, notion of a testament document. Uh, that's uh, scholarly speak nonetheless, but something to think about. Now who wrote um, the Torah? Who wrote the Pentateuch? Now of course I got some ref uh, the slide here talking about references to Mosaic authorship. There's references in the documents of the Law of Moses or the Book of the Law of Moses in the Bible itself. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 31, 24 states that Moses wrote the words of the Law in the Book, and this reference has been meant, or assumed to mean that Moses wrote it. Wisdom of Ben Sirach, a, a second century BC uh, document, makes reference to the Book of the Covenant of the Most High God, the Law that Moses commanded us. Um, we don't know exactly if that's the, our Pentateuch or not. You know, possibly some people interpret that as that. Dead Sea Scrolls call the Torah the books of Moses. Josephus and Philo refer to the books of Moses. Um, John Collins, in his introduction, writes, It seems that this tradition has its origin in the book of Moses, or excuse me, the book of Deuteronomy, and was gradually extended until Moses was regarded as not only the mediator of the laws, but also the author of the whole Pentateuch, although there is no basis for this claim in Genesis or in the narrative portions of Exodus. So, and, of course, scholars uh, question this. There's a few places where there's some... Uh, um, Strange phrases going on, the, the, the you know the time when the people are in the land of Canaan. Uh, some uh, doublets the scholars looked at that made them think, okay, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe there's something different. People like Wellhaus and Astruc, they questioned this, uh, and they came up. Eventually, some scholars came up with the documentary hypothesis, the JEDP theory, uh, that there are multiple authors of this document. They looked, they noticed things like these doublets. The variations, they notice the idea that uh, there's different names used for God in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Uh, now, the, the name thing has been kind of pulled back a lot in scholarship. Uh, for example, David Carr notes the memory uh, issue that scholars, I mean, excuse me, the scribes who memorize this document may have used variations like Elohim, God, or Adonai, Yahweh, what have you, um, as variations of the same name for God. Um, Days was a 40 days and 40 nights. How many animals in the ark? You know, when I passed through the church, I had a lady, an older lady, I, I believe she was in her 80s, if not mistaken. We had a Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, and uh, she, we were reading through this, and she was like, You know, preacher, I've always wondered how many animals were on the ark? How many of each? You know, how many nights were they on the ark? You know, the Bible says two different things. What were they? Most people kind of just read through that and kind of, you know, blend things together. They don't notice the differences. Now, I want you guys to notice these differences, these bumps, uh, these speed bumps, if you will. Okay? Um, there's uh, points of comparison in the flood. I've got that slide in there. I've got another slide on the uh, the notion of primeval history. 
kind of a summary of that. It's a story of a beginning's etiology we've mentioned uh, before in some of the notes and everything, some of the lectures. Uh, etiology, story of origins, like for example, you know, Paul Bunyan and Babe. Supposedly Paul Bunyan drug his axe and made the Grand Canyon, or Babe and Paul Bunyan were jumping around and made the Great Lakes of Minnesota, things like that, you know, stories of origins. Now, of course, these aren't as far-fetched. Well, maybe they are. They're not meant to be science stories in Genesis 1 through 11, I don't think. I don't, you know, science is a little different. They're meant to be theological stories. Um, I don't think that it's more important whether God made the earth in seven days or not, or the fact that actually God did it. I think that's the emphasis of Genesis. Now, you know, I believe God created this world. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think the emphasis in Genesis is not a literal seven days more than it is that God did it. Okay. That's, that's theological work. Um, I got a, uh, a discussion of the, the uh, Tower of Babel. I got a picture of a Babylonian ziggurat in the slides there, something to take note of. Um, patriarchal narratives. I've got some slides in there as far as summary. You got a slide in there about the uh, Haran, where Abraham was from. Um, you know. Notice there are two different covenants in Genesis 15 and 17. There's a slide on this, uh, slide 18. Um, they're a little different. Uh, and some of those doublets like this led some scholars to, to wonder whether there was a, uh, kind of a hodgepodge of sources put together to make um, the uh, Pentateuch. Also notice in Genesis 38, there is uh, an interruption in the story of Joseph, the story of Judah and Tamar. Um, some scholars have said it's an insertion, some not. It's you know, I'll let you be the judge of that. Um, but it's interesting the uh, the notion of Tamar and Judah because Tamar pops up again in the New Testament. She's one of the few women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, and she's a bit of a trickster, kind of like Abraham, kind of like uh, uh, Isaac. They tricked uh, people, tricked Pharaoh. Abraham did. And said that his wife was his sister. You know, anyway, Tamar tricks her father-in-law into having intercourse with her so that there could be a male heir. See, her husband dies. In that culture, the Leverett law system, the next son in line, the next age son, uh, would uh, be would get with a wife, the, the a brother, to produce a male heir to carry on the family name in, name in line. Well, Judah held back the next son in line. He was too young, supposedly. And eventually, you know, it never happened. So Tamar knew that Judah was going to town one day. She dressed up like a woman of the night and tricked him into having relations with her and produced a son. And that son eventually would be one of the ancestors of Jesus. So, I mean, you know, hey, every family tree's got, got some uh, uh, interesting people in it. Mine does too. Trust me. You know, my, I joke around my family. Sometimes it's kind of Jerry Springer-esque. But you know what? God's grace is there for us, and God's grace saves us, right? No matter where we come from. Now, the novella, the Joseph novella, this Joseph section of Genesis, in fact, Genesis itself ends with the descendants of Jacob in Egypt. Um, you know, despite the promises made to, by God to J Jacob and Abraham, they're kind of in Egypt. Things seem to be going well. But the next book we get to Exodus, the next page over possibly in your translation, uh, things have changed. There's a bit of a disc discontinuity there. Uh, Exodus begins with uh, the uh, descendants of Jacob no longer in power. They're the slaves now. Uh, they're suffering, and the Egyptians are their oppressors. There's maybe some uh, different uh, melding of sources there. Uh, Conrad Schmid and some of these other scholars are out there now talk about two different traditions being put together, different stories being put together, uh, molding together of it, or maybe something simply as a historical issue where a different uh, group of rulers ruled over Egypt in the, in the interim time or the different uh, times covered in the different books of Genesis 50 and Exodus 1. Well, for example, the Hyksos did take over Egypt at one point. It could be there was a change in rulers going on, and that may be why. And Exodus kind of alludes to that, but something to think about. So that's Genesis in a nutshell. Thanks.